Well, thank you very much for coming to today's event. My name is Hyun Bang Shin. I am professor of geography and urban studies in the Department of Geography and Environment here at the LSE, and also director of LSE Socio Southeast Asia Center. It's my great pleasure to uh, well, to have you in the audience, and also our distinguished speakers who have long-term experience and expertise on studying the Korean affairs. Uh, today's event is part of the LSE Fe uh, Research Festival um, um, and has been planned by the LSE, not without knowing, actually, at the summit meeting in Vietnam between the US President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. That summit meeting was going to be held today. So it was a bit of a coincidence, to be honest. But nevertheless, very un wonderful coincidence to have this meeting on the very day, on the first day of the summit meeting in Vietnam to talk about the Korean affairs. So the event entitled New Reconciliations, the two Koreas, we will be very much talking about what these uh, reconciliation movements, so to speak, are going to make, uh, uh, well, what kind of implications this movement is going to make you know, for the Korean Peninsula and also for the world as well. I must say, before we start, and you know, follow the LSE usual protocol, the Twitter hashtag for today is LSE Fest. Um, also, the fire point for tonight will be outside the new academic building, just across uh, the southwestern end of the Lincoln's Field. So in case of any fire alarm, please do evacuate uh, uh, and just meet us outside the building. And also, the order of the speech uh, today um, will be beginning with uh, Professor Vladimir at the very end. Yeah. Uh, for Professor Bla uh, Vladimir Tikhonov, my apologies, uh, followed by Dr. Jong Im Hyun uh, over here, and, also, and uh, lastly, uh, Dr. Owen Miller. Uh, we have these three speakers, who, uh, as, as I said, who have distinguished and, and uh, uh, wonderful expertise on Korean affairs. Uh, if I may to, uh, introduce briefly uh, our speakers to you. Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Vladimir Tikhonov, uh, whose Korean name is Bang Noja has been a prolific writer on Korean affairs, both in English and Korean as well. And he's probably publishing one book, almost one book a year in a sense, um, and has been professor of Korean and East Asian studies at the Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages in Oslo University. And his research has been on the history of modern ideas in Korea. Dr. Jung Im Hyun is lecturer in Korean studies at the Department of School of Languages and Global Studies in the University of Central Lancashire. And her, main, her research has been on the topics of social movement, political communication analysis, and social cultural dimension of Korean popular culture diffusion in Europe. Dr. Wei Miller, on my right, has been lecturer in Korean studies in the Department of East Asian Languages and Culture at SOAS. He studied uh, Korean study East Asian history at SOAS as an undergraduate student, after which he spent uh, some years in South Korea to learn the Korean language, language at Yonsei University and came back to SOAS to do his master's and PhD. And the PhD topic being on the merchant guilds in late 19th century Seoul. And his research has been on the social and economic history of uh, South Korea and also economic history of North Korea as well. Without further ado, um, I guess given the time constraint, we'll start immediately with uh, Professor Vladimir Tikhonov's uh, speech. Each speech will be for 10 minutes, and uh, the three speeches will be followed by Q&As. Thank you very much for the introduction, and <laughs> thank you. And thank you very much for organizing this wonderful event. So. Well, now, as the person who has been just pronounced by his former lawyer to be a con man was a cheat and who can't remember anyway, but eh. so to say is meeting our great leader today. So the world press is glued to this event. But what we are trying to do here is to look at this from a little bit different angles. In a way, and what I will try to do is to look at this not from a side, not from above, but from the ground. That is, from the perspective of the people who are living on the Korean Peninsula. But since, unfortunately, the access to the northern part of Korean Peninsula is not the easiest thing, 
I think always had been there. I have never been to North Korea and have the audacity to talk about it, so have to apologize from this. Uh, so to say, so I will be trying to look at the South Korean perspective, the grassroots perspective on the things unfolding now in Vietnam, the attempt to, well, to use the scientific terms, basically reintroduce, uh, uh, in a way, uh, put North Korea back into the capitalist world system, negotiate the terms for such reintegration. Well, what is North Korea from the viewpoint of the people who are living south to the DMZ? Perceptions are, well, changing with the time. For now, the perception of North Korea as a promising partner is close to its historical heights, while the perception of North Korea as a potential threat is close to its historical lows. Well, interestingly enough, so it's obvious that for the people living very close to North Korea, much closer than we are, it is clear that North Koreans, if they would sign an agreement with US on denuclear, nuclear, nu denuclearization, for South Koreans, it's clear that most likely they will try to follow the agreement in their own interest. The majority of South Koreans think so. The majority still think that North Korea may represent a pot potential threat, but exactly the same proportion of South Koreans also say 77% that North Korea, first for the most, is a potential partner. So the interest is obvious there, and the majority of South Koreans are saying that unification is a possibility, but again, what they want is a very gradual, <laughs> incremental unification. Basically, they want some sort of peace system now and unification in some undefined future. The process is more important than the result. Well, re reunification, why? Why should South Korea reunify with its northern neighbor? Because they speak the same language. Okay, Austrians and Germans speak the same language, and even Irish and British speak now for the most, <laughs> in the most cases, the same language, which again doesn't provide a good ground for making them into one nation. So it brings us to the question, what, what does it actually mean to be a Korean, or in our case, since I'm talking about South Korea, which I know a bit better, South Korean. If we compare various definitions of belonging, nationality in various places, indeed, compared to most other countries, South Korea puts quite a strong focus on ethnicity. I mean, it's more important than South Korea for the belonging compared to most European or indeed Asian or African states. But if you look at another piece of statistics, for majority of South Koreans today, 47% in our case, the main sign of your belonging to a place called South Korea is South Korean passport. Only for 26% that's being ethnically Korean. So I have South Korean passport in this way. Almost half of South Koreans believe that I'm Korean. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> the passport control officers in Heathrow don't believe it, but, <laughs> but South <laughs> Koreans <laughs> believe it, which is much, much more important. <laughs> so people like me now are more or less understood to belong to what is developing in South Korea. Now more and more from ethnic based into, well, politically based passport. I mean, citizenship-based community, which means many things, some good and some bad. A good thing is that people like me, non-ethnic Koreans, feel a little bit more at home in Seoul. And bad thing is that the ethnic Koreans from all the places, which openly are poorer than South Korea, North Korea, or for example, China, may feel less and less welcome in the place where I mean, their main credential for belonging, their ethnic, I mean, being part of the same ethnic community is no longer as important as before. But still, the majority of South Koreans, despite much less emphasis on ethnic belonging and ethnicity, still think that <coughs> North and South Korea at some point should become one. Why? 
what's interesting, if you read South Korean media, is that very, what is very often is being emphasized is the prospect of Korean greatness in case of unification. Okay. So it's not ethnic belonging. It's not the fulfillment of ethnic nationhood. But the fact that in case two Korea become one, in by the year 2015, Korea would be number five in the world table of ranks. I guess surpassing the Great Britain, which probably wouldn't be that great by that point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so to say, so at least that is the prognosis. So unification for the sake of national greatness, good. But then what this greatness is going to be based upon? Yet another key word which you often encounter in South Korea's conservative media, and just like here, majority of media are pretty conservative, Choim Gim No Don, the low wage labor. Low wage, high skill, high discipline, and some conservative newspapers supposed to be anti-communist, but they very much loves North Korea for one thing, there are no strikes, <laughs> obviously. So they may be very anti-communist, but at the same time, they very much emphasize this advantage <laughs> of doing business with North Korea. OK, so greatness based on exploitation of low-wage labor, not only that. Yet another keyword that we have in South Korea's conservative media is cha won resources. <laughs> Man mineral resources. North Korea is very richly endowed. You know the periodical table of elements. Much of this table is there. Mm -hmm. Very importantly, the rare earth. The rare earth. Very, very key element in producing all the electronic GMIX without which we no longer can live. You have them in China and you have them in North Korea. Actually, it's a pretty long list of what they have, which includes aluminum, magnesium, iron ore, coal, uranium, importantly, <laughs> copper, and so on and so <laughs> on. And that is what South <laughs> Koreans love to emphasize. OK, so unification for the future greatness rooted in cheap labor force, cheap and disciplined, and mineral greatness of South Korea's geolo uh, North Korea's geologi geological landscape. OK, it looks like this, but yes, I think this slide disappeared somewhere, but it, it was supposed to be here. There is yet another part here, and that is the concern, the fear, the fear of one place called China. Uh, South Koreans are keenly aware that while South Korea was less active on the North Korean front, during the 10 years under very conservative administrations, China was very active there. And as a result, lots of resource-rich places now are invested by China in concessions taken by Chinese businesses. And there is a palpable fear in South Korea's business newspapers that after Chinese grab everything, we will have nothing else to grab in a way. So you have this element of something that really in a way, reminiscent of a sort of sub-imperialist attitude vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis North Korea. The place is rich. And it is we who should grab it before Chinese take everything. So I think that my quote of 10 minutes <laughs> is going <laughs> to run out very soon. Yes. So to make some sort of conclusion, well, small conclusion, yes, good news is that South Koreans are less emphasizing the ethnical nature of belonging and citizenship. It's a good thing. It's a development. Still, they're mostly positive about reconciliation. They more tend to believe in the sincerity of North Korea elites' drive towards reintegration into the global capitalist system. They mostly believe in a sort of slow incremental unification. But one thing which we have to remember is that if you try to find out what are the reasons why unification is described in mostly very rosy tones, you find everything related to a sort of Darwinian jungles of contemporary world where unified Korea has stronger chances to climb onto the top of the food chain. 
you have this, you have a sort of sub-imperialist attitude vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis resource rich and labor rich North Korea. And you have lots of funny proposals that even after we would become a Co Korean confederation, the movement of North Korean labor to South should be strictly restricted. The cheap labor should be in its place. Because once it's, this cheap labor is, is in South Korea, it's no longer cheap. <laughs> Those people will have Korean citizenship and obviously will claim their right to South Korean wages, which many business newspapers don't seem to like. <laughs> so to say, so yes, the good news is that unification is being eagerly waited for. The bad news is that South Korea is terribly neoliberal place. <laughs> And the plans for unification are obviously influenced by this important fact. <coughs> that is it. Thank you very I much. I hope that I didn't uh, overuse my time. Thank you. Uh, while we wait for our next speaker's talk, uh, I think one of the uh, contexts within which these talks are embedded will be the preceding talks between North Korea and South Korea leaders, and you know, the president of South Korea meeting North Korean leader uh, multiple times before North Korean leader was having the summit meeting with the uh, U.S. president. And there has, have, have, have been a number of uh, talks between South Korea and North Korea moving towards, you know, the two countries moving towards reconciliation. And I think these are the kind of context within which you may find the, uh, the talks of today uh, are fairly uh, uh, relevant and embedded. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Jung Im-hyun, please. OK, um, hello. Um, I'd like to cover, in fact, uh, North Korean wo woman's role uh, from past, present, and now uh, future. Um, why I was interested in um, North Korean woman's role was, in fact, I met some uh, three defectors, women, all of them were women, defectors uh, here in UK. And I had an opportunity to talk quite long talk about uh, their journey. So that's why um, I uh, wanted to present uh, uh, what was and is and will be uh, women's role in North Korea, and maybe eventually um, their future role after possible reconciliation of two Koreas. So um, this magazine is the only one official magazine in North Korea for women. So it's um, dictated by uh, the party and state. So usually women's role uh, official in, in this, this school was um, a daughter or a kind of flower. So daughter, obviously, uh, of supreme readers. And the flower of the family, society, and the nation. So, but. In the early period of state building uh, of North Korea, because they need the labor, so they encouraged women to participate all kinds of labor, even mining. And of course, uh, other uh, light industry as well. So um, arriving in 1970, because the regime is quite, uh, was quite stabilized because the Kim Il-sung was using Juche and uh, their state was quite um, secure. And from that time, um, the official discourse about women, not only uh, as important as a worker, uh, but also uh, they emphasize the role of mother, uh, of course, in uh, family, but in uh, the society as well. Then arrived in 1990s, uh, as you may all know, after uh, famine, they intensified, uh, interestingly, a uh, mother's role uh, of woman in the North Korean society. That's because uh, state, because state and party was considered as uh, parents of uh, people. And arrived in 1990 because of the famine, the state and the party could not uh, take care of their people, their child. So women should do this role. So in official discourse, mother's role was uh, uh, quite um, 
important. But now in uh, Kim Jong Un, uh, I saw uh, the magazine uh, Joseon uh, Yeosung. Um, this uh, patriarchal state uh, discourse maintained, but now slightly uh, they emphasize men's role in the family. For example, uh, men should divide their uh, household works with their wives as well. Why? Because um, after the famine, North Korea could not distribute uh, food for their people. So only one kilogram of rice is, is a salary for, for um, civil servant. And half of the, so 500 gram of rice for their wives stay in uh, home. So it is not enough to, uh, to survive. So that's why uh, maybe you heard about Changmada, it's kind of market. And I met um, two weeks ago, the woman who was engaged in this uh, market, and she explained, this is only the official uh, market, but around, uh, around this market, one kilometers, uh, other uh, people, they could not buy this spot, they could not pay, so uh, they were selling uh, the, the goods. And you can buy everything, in fact. So this Changmadang experience, in fact, um, women became a uh, real uh, bread owner in North Korea. And a main agent of uh, consumers. So uh, according to her explanation, husband without economic power, they call it um, in Korea. That means light in daytime, so it's useless. <laughs> <laughs> and domestic dog, uh, Mong Mong is quite cute in Korean, but I don't know if you speak Korean. Domestic dog, he's just eat and do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, woman gain um, uh, a power um, in family. So I think it's kind of a sprout to weaken uh, the established social and political order in North Korea. And maybe eventually uh, it could become uh, one of uh, agents to uh, change the society. But I think it will uh, take time. Um, well, my slide finished here. Mm. I remember uh, one of, um, well, once in a conference, I met a PhD student who was doing, in fact, he, he was collecting uh, oral literature in Korea. And he, he he was doing kind of anthropological research. And I told him what you've run uh, after collecting oral uh, literature uh, among his um, <laughs> farmers. And he told me, <coughs> then I realized uh, to sustain South Korea, South Korean society, uh, well, his thoughts, to sustain South Korean society, Men did everything, because he was under the Confucianist ethic. But then, collecting the oral literature, he realized, in fact, women, women did everything uh, to sustain uh, the society, because they, they have a household level. And in, uh, in the countryside, they should uh, do work in the, in the field. And they raised the child in the three, threefold uh, levels. But in, for South, uh, North Korean women, uh, on top of that, uh, fourth row, um, they uh, should earn and the bread. And even uh, because it was not possible to um, earn the bread in North Korea, they should escape, they should fled from uh, North Korea and uh, um, Believe me, uh, their life was really, um, really hard. Maybe I can uh, take the questions. Ed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now move to the last speaker of today, uh, Dr. Wen Miller.
Uh, good evening. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to stay here. I don't have slides, so um, I can see everyone. I think everyone can see me. So. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I wanted to sort of present a bit of a what what I think is a bit of a different way of looking at the two careers, based on my own work a bit and based on really actually my experience of teaching more than anything. I, I guess it comes from a position of teaching modern Korean history and quite often being quite, uh, I suppose, quite frustrated with the way that uh, the, the, the two, North and South Korea, are talked about in, in mainstream discourses, um, often as being really quite alien uh, entities incommensurate, you could say, uh, two countries with completely different systems and completely different societies. And for me, studying history, particularly economic history and history of development in the two Koreas, that doesn't actually make sense to me. <laughs> so I'll try to say something about why that doesn't make sense. And perhaps I will try to draw out some conclusions which relate to to um, reconciliation or, or the future, although I'm a bit, I'm a bit tentative, I'm a bit hesitant to do that. Um, <clears throat> when, I, when I teach modern Korean history, I try to teach the two Koreas very much together and, and teach them in close comparison with one another, because I think that is very illuminating for understanding both countries. Uh, so I try to show the similarities and the connections as much as the differences. Um, now, I would say here that this is not because I believe in some kind of, uh, you know, national essence of, of Korea that is transcendental and it transcends, uh, you know, politics, culture and, and you know, historical differences. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm not an essentialist in that way, but uh, I, I, I try to look at things in this way because I think that the, the two careers have grown up together symbiotically and their histories are deeply intertwined. Uh, although they are separated by this seemingly impenetrable barrier of the, of the DMZ and of two, um, two ideologies. So I think concretely the two careers, you know, while they look superficially different and while they have trumpeted their ideological distinctiveness at every opportunity, for nearly or around 70 years, uh, they have actually trodden extremely similar developmental paths and under similar constraints and with similar goals in the end. So I'm going to say something about um, really about the Cold War period mainly. But then I'll try and finish up by saying something about how things have changed since then. Um, <clears throat> I think the Cold War, the geopolitics of the Cold War, which was sort of found in a very concentrated form on the Korean Peninsula, they actually helped create two systems with remarkable similarities to each other. Um, <clears throat> however, they didn't develop exactly at the same time. They tended to sort of slightly leapfrog each other in the way that they, they, they grew and developed their economies from the 1950s through to uh, the 1980s. Um, so I'm going to give a kind of loose periodization of how I see that economic development operating in the two careers on the, on the Korean Peninsula. Um, I would say you have a period from the end of the, the Korean War uh, up until the end of the 1960s, when actually you have considerable convergence between the two careers. This is the period when they, they grow to look more like each other, in fact. And it, at that point, of, as, as I guess many people know, I don't know, but it's North Korea that took the lead, really. North Korea, in a way, was the one who almost provided the model. Um, but it was not unique to Korean Peninsula, it was not unique to East Asia. It was a state-led development model which was tried all over the world with varying degrees of uh, success. But in, the, in this period from the, from the mid-50s to the late 60s then, there's certain particular features um, <clears throat> of, the, of the two Koreas. One is that they both benefited greatly from aid from their sponsors, of course, 
uh, the USSR and the United States, respectively. The second is that they both pursued a policy of rapid industrialization based on a low wage or low consumption policy. Essentially, you know, extracting resources from the countryside and from, from workers in order to build up industry as rapidly as possible. A third thing that they both did was to attempt to build a quite extensive authoritarian state, um, and a state which attempted to subordinate everyday life and to, inter 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 to drill down into people's everyday lives or, you know, in a very ambitious way in order to subordinate people's lives to that drive of industrialization. As, a, as a, another part of that um, authoritarian state was militarization. Both Koreas underwent uh, ex after, well, accelerated, of course, by the Korean War, but continuing through the next decades after the Korean War, very extensive militarization of life. Uh, and you only have to talk to any young Korean man or older Korean man to know how much militarization of Korean society has affected their lives, whether they're from North or South Korea. This, of course, reflects the intense geopolitical rivalry that existed in the, Korea, in, in the Cold War and was concentrated, as I said, on the, the Korean Peninsula. Um, a final factor I'm going to highlight here in this period is uh, a very heavy emphasis in both Koreas on the importance of ideology, the importance of correct ideology. Um, <clears throat> one country essentially founded upon anti-communist ideology and the physical manifestation of anti-communist ideology, which was really can be located in a series of massacres before and around the time of the, the Korean War. That's South Korea, obviously. Uh, and another country founded really, or uh, Kim Il-sung's state founded upon uh, kind of a Stalinist ideology and a, and a purification, the process of purification and purging in order to obtain uh, kind of um, security for him, himself and, and his followers in the period after the Korean War. Uh, then I'll move on to a second period, a period beginning in the 1970s when you see the two Koreas diverging. <clears throat> um, what happens in the 1970s? Well, the most important thing here, I think, the, the key factor that produces a divergence between the two Koreas is really the, is the Vietnam War, which is interesting that we are now talking on a day when um, <clears throat> the leader of North Korea and, and the US president are meeting in Vietnam. But the Vietnam War marked as a turning point for South Korea, um, and it, it produced a huge dividend for South Korea uh, and allowed South Korea to internationalize its capitalist economy and to reap great rewards from that, alongside the establishment of other things such as a triangular economic trade system in East Asia involving Japan, the US, and, and, and South Korea. So from that point onwards, South Korea became, in, South Korean um, capitalism became internationalized and became much more deeply integrated into the world economy. And on the other hand, North Korea's economy went, in the, unfortunately for them, in the opposite direction. They tried to internationalize. They did try in the early 1970s to increase their trade. They increased their trade massively with Western European countries and Japan, but it ended in disaster for them, actually, and they ended in, in huge debt, as did many other uh, developing countries in the world that attempted to do the same thing and did not have the advantage of the, the war dividend uh, and other structural factors that South Korea had. So that's the beginning of a divergence there. I'm going to um, try to move on to a conclusion, as I only have uh, uh, a couple of minutes left. Um, <clears throat> I think that the most important thing I want to emphasize here as a conclusion, really, is the, the consequences of this kind of rapid to forced pace development that took place under intense geopolitical pressures in both North and South Korea was to sort of, in my opinion, to kind of traumatize two nations, really. Uh, I think <clears throat> looking forward to reconciliation in the future, the most important thing that has to be dealt with are the traumas of, of, the, of the past in both Koreas. Um, in a sense, I, you know, teaching modern Korean history, I sometimes apologize to my students for having to put them through repeated descriptions of the 
the horrors that have been in, inflicted on the, in the two Koreas during the late 20th century. And it, you know, in a sense, I've come, I've come to think almost of, of both Koreas as being countries of you know, 75 million people who are suffering from a kind of PTSD, a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder from the, from the experiences of, of the late 20th century, uh, which, which are really due to that the intensity of the Cold War that existed on, on the Korean Peninsula. So going forward into the future, my feeling as a historian is that there needs to be a really strong emphasis on not just reconciliation, but accounting for the past. That's a process which actually did begin in South Korea in the early 2000s under liberal governments, where they began to really investigate under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission <coughs> what had happened the massacres, the, the, the mass imprisonments, the torture, and so on in the past. Uh, and that process was somewhat cut short um, in more recently. But I think that process in the future will need to expand over the whole peninsula to understand what this, sim this, this, rather, this extremely destructive symbiotic relationship between the two Koreas has meant for ordinary people. In my opinion as well is that this will need much more kind of bottom-up participation. I, I don't know how and, and, and when that kind of bottom-up participation in reconciliation can happen, but I don't see a true reconciliation being achieved on, on the Korean Peninsula by Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un meeting in a banquet room and eating fine food. That's not, in my opinion, how, how it will happen. It will have to happen through an investigation of the past and through uh, people somehow getting together and accounting for what has, what has happened to Korea. Okay. Sorry if that's not a very positive view for the future, <laughs> but that's, my, that's where I will finish. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think when you hear the, the media reports about the, uh, the, the situations in Korea and involving the US, China, and so on, you often hear about the uh, kind of in an international relations perspective, you know, what's going to happen to the nuclear issues, what's going to happen you know, to this you know, geopolitical relationship between the superpowers and the Koreas, and especially the, the North Korea, which is often depicted in a very horrendous way, you know, as a kind of an kind of isolated country you know, ruled by you know, this mad dictator, uh, which is kind of you know, the view uh, that is being shared by one group of you know, uh, observers. But also there's another view which is trying to understand a bit more from the, uh, from the perspective of, uh, I guess, insiders to some extent, you know, uh, trying to understand what the wars, uh, uh, the Korean War uh, actually meant for the countries, for the people, and what they actually feel uh, when it comes to living on the peninsula uh, in a situation where the war has never ended. Uh, it's technically still the two Koreas are at war, and this is one of the topics that is at the center of you know, the current bilateral meeting, the summit meeting between the US and North Korea to actually think about uh, declaring the end of the uh, uh, war uh, that has never ended, but also to think about how to bring about the peace in the region, but also what those actually mean for the people themselves uh, within uh, North and South Korea. And I think today's talks were really trying to kind of highlight some of the dimensions that will actually affect uh, the people, the actual you know, concrete lives of people who are living on the peninsula <coughs> while we are so much you know, inundated with all the stories of the superpowers and the high profile you know, figures dominating the current discourse of Korean reconciliation. So uh, before we go into Q&A, uh, let me just uh, remind you the event today is recorded uh, to be made available by podcast and also by video, unless there's any technical glitch. <laughs> later on. Um, and also the event itself is also organized by the Department of Geography and Environment as part of the LSE this festival um, with the title of New World Disorder and Order. So there will be a roving mic go going around for questions. So we'll take two questions at a time from the audience. So there's one over here and another at the back. Yes. Can you tell us who you are you know, before you Ask Thank you. My name is Duncan Bartlett. I'm the editor of a magazine called Asian Affairs. Two phrases came out to me during that discussion. One was that there was a very strong emphasis on uh, the focus on ethnicity in Korea, and also that Korea was recovering from a period of trauma. 
I'm thinking about the relationship between South Korea and Japan at the moment, because particularly in 2019, there's been a deterioration in the relationship, and the issue of comfort women has been at the center of the disagreements. Um, I'm particularly interested to hear how Dr. Hyun reads that situation. Do you think this is a response to past trauma? And perhaps the panel would also like to speculate on how that might affect the process towards reconciliation between the two Koreas, including the discussions in Vietnam. Okay, can you let's take uh, one more question uh, somewhere in the center? Yes, about fifth row from the front. Hello, so uh, I'm Abhishek, and um, I'm a student here at the LSE. I'm studying management, but very interested in the Korea. Uh, situation. Um, my question is that, you know, um, I think this is primarily directed to Professor Tikhonov, um, is that you seem to say that there's this kind of big cultural identity of being South Korean and uh, like this it's become a very distinct identity now. Um, what challenges do you think that poses for the possibility for reunification if people believe more so that they're South Korean than Korean in general? Thank you. Okay, so could you uh, briefly respond to these two questions first? So. Uh, okay. Yes, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, the so uh, let me ask you if I understand understood correctly. Uh, do you want to know about the relationship with Japan and? Uh, yes, there's been a, there's been a deterioration in the South Korean mm -hmm. relationship this year. What do you what do you read in that in terms of? Okay, uh, well, actually, I have a good friend of um, uh, NGOs. In, um, uh, uh, she, in fact, uh, she raised this issue, comfort zone, in 1990s. Yeah, of course, it's a, a big trauma. But then um, the political discourse uh, of uh, Abe's government is quite different from uh, Japanese NGOs, in fact. Uh, there are many um, NGOs was helping, in fact, this uh, foundation for comfort women. And the victims, now they are a very old grannies, they do not have a remorse for common Japanese people at all. Uh, for example, when the earthquake happened, those grannies even donate their modest sums to uh, to Japanese people. So uh, only one thing they want, just official apology from uh, Japanese government, that's all. This is clear and simple, <laughs> that's all. Yes, um, Yes. well, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting question. The thing is that in South Korea now, two processes are going in parallel. And one process is the building of a sort of multi-ethnic society. It's still not as multi-ethnic as UK, for example. But today, there is a higher proportion of non-ethnic Koreans in South Korea than if we compare with Japan, non-ethnic Japanese in Japan. Non-ethnic Korean, non-Korean population of the non-ethnic Korean population of South Korea now stands at around 4% level while non-ethnic Japanese population of Japan is around 2,8%, as far as I can remember. And in South Korea, the rate of growth for non-ethnic Korean population is around 8% per year, which means that in due course, 10, 15 years, South Korea would be like average EU country, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> so, so to say, that's one process. So, in internationalization of South Korean population, another process, South Korea being made into a sort of a, well, poster child for global neoliberalism, and neoliberalization of South Korea is something that is happening not only on the level of institutions, but unfortunately on the, also on the level of attitudes, also shared by the majority. For majority of South Koreans, now it looks pretty much like an accepted truth that reunification, if it happens, should serve some sort of economic goal. And in order to serve the economic goal, 
the wage levels in North Korea should be artificially depressed, basically by somehow curbing the migration of former North Koreans into South Korea. In a way, so if we look at the proposals for North-South Korean confederation or sort of pan-Korean community, most of them include the clause on the on having maintaining separate labor markets <laughs> for the time being for basically decades <laughs> to come. So to say so, it looks like in case North Korea is going to be reincorporated into world capitalist system and coupled together with South Korea's mature neoliberal industrialism, it looks like in this process, North Koreans probably will have to fight a lot if they are to get the sort of social rights that now South Korean workers, for example, are more or less, well, not enjoying. I wouldn't say they enjoy that much, as Owen <laughs> had mentioned, but anyway, South Koreans mentioned, uh, managed to obtain certain social rights in the course of very hard struggle in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And North Korean, for North Korean workers, the life is not going to be easy mm. in the coming decades. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, yeah, there's one at the <coughs> back um, and one here at the front, and then we'll come back next. Uh, hi, my name is Jenny, and I'm also a student here. My question is, um, as the two Koreas gradually appear to become closer and closer, what do you think their individual relationship with China and US will become? Okay, so that's one question. Uh, the two Koreas getting close, uh, uh, coming close to each other and what the relationships between two Koreas and China slash US. There's one question here in the front row. Um, I have been lucky enough to visit North Korea, and what I've seen there is the deification of the Kim dynasty, and that the objective of the Kim dynasty is to retain that dynasty for the foreseeable future, and that that's the principal objective. So I don't see any time in the near future any possibility of reunification because, in my understanding, reunification would mean the end of the North Korean dynasty. So I can't see how that could possibly happen anytime, anytime soon. Um, if I may add one question using my chair's kind of privilege, uh, very brief one, in relation to this uh, <coughs> second question. So Manuel Castells, for example, you know, was, uh, when he was discussing the developmental state, Developmental state, which uh, has been the term frequently used to describe the the developmental pathway of you know, emerging, uh, previously emerging economies like South Korea and Singapore, what Manuel Carter was trying to say was developmental state gains their legitimacy by working on this national project to build up the national identity, but at the same time trying to uh, by by being able to uh, promote development in order to change the uh, uh, economic order while keeping this social order status quo. Mm. So I'm just kind of, if, if the uh, North Korean economy is going to experience this developmental drive, to what extent North Korean society may encounter the changes to economic order and perhaps keeping the status quo of the social order uh, without changing it. So I guess the questions may go to uh, uh, maybe Owen uh, and Vladimir, perhaps. Um. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, in response to this this thing about the Kim Dynasty, uh, yeah, obviously uh, there there are a great many very large barriers in the way of of unification, and I don't think well, I doubt whether any of us would here would think that unification is going to happen soon. I mean, uh, it, if thing if the current trajectory continues, it looks to me as though there is going to be a process of some kind of reconciliation, possibly, well, not possibly, likely some greater economic integration. So mm -hmm. the kind of pilot project they had of Kaesong, the, 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 the uh, industrial park, which was operational until 2016, I think, for about 10 years, 
I mean, that kind of thing will be expanded. But that's not the same as political unification into one state. I mean, I don't see any prospect for that unless there's some kind of major catastrophic type event, or not catastrophic, some kind of major social upheaval uh, in, in North Korea. I don't see any, any prospect of it, mm. personally. But, but what we are looking at is, is, is reconciliation and some forms of integration, I think, probably, if the current tra trajectory continues. But even that's not so. Well, if I am to follow on this dynasty thing, well, in South Korea too we have dynasties. <laughs> <laughs> One dynasty in Samsung, now it's being ruled by third generation ruler from Lee clan, Lee jae -yong. So Samsung now is responsible for around one fourth of South Korea's GNP. And what is interesting, one funny thing about Samsung is the way how he works I mean, the country Samsung used to prefer for doing business used to be China. And what was funny is how artful Samsung was in working with China's own princeling dynasties when it had to do business there. You know, one of the largest plants Samsung built for semiconductors, to produce semiconductors in China, was built in Xi'an. And one good reason for this was because Xi'an is connected to Xi Jinping's own <laughs> dynastic past, his father, Xi Junxun, used to work at the city, and mm -hmm. Samsung wanted somehow to play on this. Mm -hmm. so, so to say, so Samsung really loved doing business in China because <coughs> as long as you know how to work with the ruling dynasties of China's ruling oligarchy, it's very easy to, good, to get good conditions and you get some sort of guarantees. In, in a way, for, uh, for certain level of surplus value extraction. The thing is that if South Korean business dynasties really want to prevent North Korean laborers from getting better conditions by moving into South Korea, what they do need is exactly some sort of continuation of dynastic rule in North Korea, as Owen said, because that will be a guarantee that North Korean workers would, would stay where they are. So to say, providing the ground for the surplus value extraction by South Korean businesses if they're going to invest there. So and another thing was about balancing between uh, PRC and USA. The thing is that actually North Koreans are a bit better in balancing than their South Korean brethren since they balanced China and USSR for quite a long time, since uh, 1950s. Uh, in a way, and I do think that, in fact, now it looks like Kim Jong-un is going to play a bit of this balancing game, trying to raise his <laughs> stock value, so to say, in the eyes of both American and Chinese rulers, and probably get what he needs from both money, investment, and technology, basically. Uh, South Koreans, unfortunately, are not very good in balancing. In South Korea, you have certain power institutions, especially the military, where the relationship with the U.S. are basically symbi symbiotic. South Korean military is, by and large, an outgrowth of U.S. military. So to say that, so I'm not sure to which degree South Korea would be able to play this balancing game. North Koreans are much better than this. <laughs> so, and when, uh, yes, about the economic and social order. The thing is that what looks most likely now is that if North Korea would be loaded back into the sun, <laughs> into the good graces of world capitalist system, it will end up as a state bureaucratic, is a state bureaucratic capitalist society, so to say, and we do have the models in China and Vietnam now, and what is interesting is that China today is one of the great centers of workers' movement worldwide. Only in Guangdong every year you have around 1,000 <laughs> strikes, big and small. So to say, it's, if you look at the intensity of strike movement, China is ahead of both South Korea and Japan, in fact. So to say, and in Vietnam, it's interesting that in Vietnam, strikes are even officially allowed. In China, it's neither prohibited nor allowed. <laughs> so I'm sure that we are going to see very interesting developments on the ground in North Korea, too, as economic order will bring some changes in social consciousness. We are going to witness very interesting developments on the ground. Vladimir's re response to uh, Samsung reminds me of how in Vietnam, <laughs> where the summit meeting between US and mm -hmm. 
uh, North Korea uh, is taking place at, as of now, uh, Samsung in Vietnam, actually, Samsung's export revenue, the Samsung Vietnam's export revenue accounts for 25%, nearly 25% of Vietnam's exports. Mm. <laughs> so it's a Samsung's presence also in Vietnam is also quite significant. I think we have time just enough to get two more last, uh, two last questions and one here in the second row and perhaps one at the back uh, where the hands was uh, a little <laughs> sooner than others. Uh, thank you. Uh, like the previous, uh, uh, previous uh, questioner, I've also visited North Korea. And my question is quite simply, um, can the experience of China in the last 40 years be a template for uh, North Korea, if only that is to provide a degree more stability? Okay. R one last question at the back, uh, with glasses. <coughs> Hi, um, my question is, um, I think there's a great, we, we talked about the reconciliation between the two Koreas. Um, we also talked about different attitudes in, within South Korea about reconciliation with North Korea. Um, I would just like to gather your thoughts on the reconciliation between generations in South Korea, because from my personal experiences, you have a lot of the younger generation who, have, who don't have PTSD, who are not from the war generation and their attitudes towards North Korea are becoming quite agnostic. And you know, they, their bigger concerns are to do with education, employment, um, th their uh, place in the world stage rather than North Korea. So that's, thanks. Uh, given the time constraint, uh, can I ask uh, speakers, each one of the speakers, to uh, provide a you know, short and brief, concise, effective response to the questions? <laughs> one by one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I must do it first. Well, it's not only China, I think. You have the template called state bureaucratic capitalism. It is not only China that exemplifies this new and pretty mainstream economic order. You have societies from Vietnam in the southeast to say, well, Russia, Belarusia in the northwest exemplifying what state bureaucratic capitalism is, and all of them provide some template some possible metrics for North Korea's development inside the world capitalist system. And when it comes to generations in South Korea, young generation is extremely neoliberal in some ways. It's one phrase that I have heard on South Korean streets about reconciliation with North Korea. Which means that yes. <laughs> in case it would the, it will go wrong, uh, or you say a flock of beggars from North Korea will descend upon us. Yes, and neoliberalism now is very much a part of our young souls. And it's, it's, it's a big issue. It's, it's a really big issue. Society has to do something with this. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think you are too harsh about um, <laughs> 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 doing government and, uh, for young generations. But according to uh, recent the poll, the opinion, um, public opinions are uh, really changing. Uh, especially for really <laughs> young child, because they may be um, educated by their teachers about reconciliation. But somehow, um, I'm uh, positive. <laughs> I am um, uh, born in uh, positive people. Um, I think uh, Moon Jae-in government did really well. If uh, there were no uh, people's protest in uh, 2016, this kind of uh, breakthrough could not be happen. So even though Samsung <laughs> governed South Korean society, mm -hmm. I think I, 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 I have a great hope for in on people, South Korean people. I don't think I have that much to add. I mean, just in relation to this last point, yes, uh, and the younger generation, obviously, it's quite understandable why they would be more concerned with their with their own future. And uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm strongly of opinion, really, that 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 essentially, although I've talked in my, my introduction about how the, the two Koreas share this kind of symbiotic relationship, essentially they have grown to be two different countries with different cultures and different, you know. So I'm slightly contradicting myself maybe, but you know, it's understandable that people don't have that sense of affinity. Unfortunately though, or fortunately, unfortunately, they live on the same rather small piece of land. So they will have to 
find a way to reconcile and live together at some point. Otherwise, there will be more tragedies in the future. That doesn't mean unification necessarily. I, I would say unification probably is not a good idea anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, there's uh, kind of where we don't <laughs> hope, unfortunately, we don't have enough time you know, uh, to go into further discussions you know, when the discussions were just about to get you know, more in interesting. <laughs> uh, LSD Festival has been you know, including all the events that talk about what's going on in Mexico, in, in Brazil, um, in Europe, in the UK, um, in, of course, in South Korea, in, in North Korea. All these issues are very important uh, for South Koreans and for e Northeast Asians. Uh, these issues of reconciliation will have you know, very strong you know, lasting uh, implications, which will be not only affecting the North Korean, uh, the Northeastern region, but also the entire world in terms of how the longest uh, divided you know, countries uh, since the uh, Second World War uh, have been you know, trying to make things uh, quite different uh, as of now. And I think the whole ongoing meetings, they will capture the eyes of uh, the global populations, the events that are taking place as of now, and people are going to look forward to what's going to happen and what the news is going to deliver as we wake up tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I think there will be uh, further discussions and hopefully the contributions made by our three excellent speakers today we provide uh, us with some more insight into understanding the current affairs in northeastern region and also, of course, on uh, within the two Koreas. So thank you very much uh, uh, for the two speakers and also for the audience for being wonderful members of audience today. Thank you. Thank you.